There is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or lose our ventures. From the Emperor of Mankind. Twenty legions of space marines were created by the Emperor during the Great Crusade to join and lead his quest to unite all of humanity under the aegis of the Imperium of Man. The nascent Proto-Legion known as the Primus or First Legion, later renamed after a series of cognomens including the First, the Angels of Death, and the Uncrowned Princes as the Angelis Tenebraium or Dark Angels was the very first of those original, first founding legions to be created at the beginning of the Great Crusade. The first legion was raised first to active service in a staged process of testing and trials before the full active force was created through mass recruitment. Each stage of creation resulted in an expansion of the gene seed implantation on progressively larger groups of neophytes. During the Unification Wars on Tala, they were the first of the Space Marine Legions to be created and were therefore originally under the command of the Emperor himself. Once he discovered Lionel Johnson on Caliban, however, the Primarch took command of the Dark Angels that had been created from his genetic stock, and he was granted command of the 4th Expeditionary Fleet of the Great Crusade. The Compliance of Molech one of Lion L. Johnson's earliest campaigns as commander of the newly dubbed Dark Angels Legion was the imperial compliance of the newly discovered night world of Molech. This was a massive, joint compliance operation between multiple Legiones Astartes, including the Dark Angels, Lunar Wolves, Emperor's children, white scars, and thousands of Imperialis Auxilia soldiers, and various Mechanicum and Legio Titanicus assets. Cyprian Devine of House Devine was named planetary governor of Molech. In the presence of several of his Primarch sons, the Emperor led them to a warp gate hidden underground, where he proceeded to utilize it to enter into the realm of chaos to parley with the Ruiner's powers. When he finally returned, he appeared aged, but much more powerful. He then psychically suppressed his son's memories of Molech and stationed a large garrison force comprised of nearly a hundred Imperialis Auxilia regiments, three Legio Titanicus cohorts, along with detachments from two Space Marine legions to protect the secrets of the Warp Gate. The Second and Third Rangdan Xenocides Next, the Dark Angels took part in the vital campaigns of the final Rangdan Xenocides. They fought alongside titans from the Legio Griffonicus, Legio Vulturum, and Legio Cidianos, as well as other Xanite Mechanicum forces from the Forge world of Xana II. The conflict began in 862 M30, when the Rangda, that 
Xenos terror long thought extinguished in the earlier first Rangdan Xenocide fell upon the northern reaches of the Imperium in numbers that defied belief. For almost a solar decade, the veterans of the First Legion, now the Dark Angels, fought to hold at bay an enemy that threatened to consume all the worlds of mankind. The Lion wrought his own legend in those dark times, a grim figure of death and vengeance that descended upon the Rangda in a cold fury. In the first dire standard years of the conflict, when the Imperium seemed lost in a tide of Xenos fiends and their slaves, the Lion stood tall amid the carnage. He was no golden hero like his brother Sanguinius, nor a black humored figurehead like Horus Lupercal, but rather a silent rock, unyielding in the storm. He did not inspire loyalty nor any other virtue, rather he went forth where the foe was strongest armored by his pride and confidence, and drew others along with him for the simple honor of standing by his side. For nearly a solar decade, the battles would rage, some nine space marine legions taking part in the fighting, and ravaging human colonies across the northern sectors of the Imperium. Of those legions caught up in the fighting, many would suffer serious losses, the Space Wolves making the loss of some 5,000 Astartes, breaking the siege of Xana alone, and the Dark Angels, gathered once again in almost their full number, bore a toll of their own. The Angels hurled themselves at their enemies and broke their greater strength in countless battles against the vile Xenos on the edge of the Halo Stars. This campaign culminated in the third Rangdan Xenocide around 890 M30, which resulted in the loss of the lives of 50,000 Dark Angel Space Marines spent in preventing the destruction of perhaps the entire Northern Imperium by the alien menace from the Outer Darkness. At the breaking of the Great Citadel of Vorksag, during the vast clash of void ships over Morkar and the seven solar week long Battle of Moreau, where three companies of the Dark Angels held against more than a million Rang Dang Nero shackled servitors, victory was bought at the cost of their lives and the blood of the old legion. For when victory was at last proclaimed and the Rang Dang menace vanquished for the final time, the Dark Angels were but a tenth of their old number. Some say the old legion fought to prove themselves worthy of their new master. Others, they bled to make right their failure to destroy the Rangda when first they met at the Battle of Advex Moors. And a few whispered that the lion sent them into slaughter so he might replace them with more tractable Calibanite warriors. Whether true or not, it was to Caliban that the Lion turned to replenish the ranks of his legion. With the Rangdan plague driven back, the first new influx of true Calibanite space marines entered the ranks of the legion, where once they had been but the few older companions of the Primarch. Now, they were dispersed across all the wings and orders of the Legion. 
They were a new breed of warrior for the First Legion, guided more by tradition and ritual than their forebears, and unburdened by the weight of pride that had been the lodestone of the Tehran veterans. In the wake of the Second Rangdan Xenocide, it was this changed legion that went forth to continue its works and to bring war to the most fell of foes. From Caliban, they spread out across the stars, for unlike many of their brethren, they took few strongholds, save for the lonely chantry holes that held the knowledge of the Legion. Each of their expeditionary fleets was bound to a different corner of the Imperium, to patrol the dark places where monsters were still to be found. The Lion took command of one such fleet, no larger or more grand than any other, for he expected each to be an engine of death capable of defeating any foe and set course for the world known to Imperial cartographers as Sarosh. Due to the extensive losses suffered by the First Legion during the Rangdan Xenocides by 899M30, the Ultramarines Legion were on the cusp of becoming the largest Space Marine Legion, standing at around 166,000 Legionaries. The Feud of Dulan As the Space Marine Legions pushed back the frontiers of the Imperium, each Primarch strove to excel in the eyes of the Emperor, and none more so than Lehman Russ, Primarch of the Space Wolves. Only Horace Lupercal and Lion L. Johnson could claim more victories than him and this was a constant frustration. It was on the world of Delan in 870M30, where the Space Wolves were fighting alongside the Dark Angels, that matters came to a head. This incident would start the millennia-long rivalry between the Dark Angels and the Space Wolves. The planetary governor of Dulan, Durath had denounced the Space Wolf Primarch Lehman Russ as the Emperor's lapdog and swore to feed his heart to his pet, Grox. Russ, enraged, swore to kill Durath himself and demanded the satisfaction of leading the assault. Johnson, however, had meticulously planned the attack and was not about to let his brother's hot-headedness foil his plans. Johnson led the assault, leaving Russ to watch helplessly as he killed Durath. After the battle, Russ stormed into the fortress and struck Johnson across the room. A brawl ensued that lasted a full solar day and night the two combatants being said to be equally matched. While Russ was slightly stronger, the lion was slightly quicker. Russ eventually ceased and started laughing, realizing how foolish their fight was and how he had allowed his pride and temper to get the better of him. Johnson, however, still angry at what he considered the Treachery of Russ's first punch knocked the laughing Space Wolf out cold with one final blow. By the time Russ regained consciousness, the Dark Angels had departed for new fields of battle in the Great Crusade. It has since been customary for selected champions from both chapters to engage in a non-lethal duel whenever they meet so that honor may be satisfied. The Battle of Dulan and the infamous feud between the Dark Angels and the Space Wolves is a tale told many times. 
In essence, it is always recounted as a simple tale, yet one that has seen a number of tellings, each of which has had its own agenda, and rarely has that agenda been the simple truth. Lehman Ross and Lionel Johnson were both assigned to the conquest of the world of Delan, and while the Space Wolves waited and lay siege, the Dark Angels staged a sudden assault that allowed them to claim the honor of the final victory. On hearing of this, it is most often claimed that Lehman Ross flew into a rage and assaulted his brother leading to the legendary duel between them that their legion's successor chapters are rumored to reenact whenever they meet. This has led to the popular assumption of a bitter grudge between the Space Wolves and the Dark Angels, a sense of lasting ill will brought about by this single isolated incident that has been accepted by history as fact. Yet, those two legions and their later successor chapter fought together on a number of occasions, both before and after the Battle of Dulan. Without rancor and in many cases with a noted sense of shared camaraderie, indeed, it has often been noted that the two Primarchs, Lion, L. Johnson and Lehman Russ, were of much the same character though they oft expressed it differently. Both were practical to their core, with little time for frivolity or the excesses of civilization. Both valued plain speaking over political necessity, and judged men and women by the actions they took rather than the words they spoke. But above all, the two Primarchs placed the utmost value on loyalty, holding their oaths as iron bonds and reserving the deepest hate for those who would forsake a vow. This being true, it throws the events on Dulan and the grudge they are supposed to have given birth to into a strange light. That the two fought is not in doubt for too many sources agree on it, that either came to hold a grudge is implausible. If anything, the record of the two Primarchs suggests a deep bond of trust and mutual respect. Together they had seen the end of the Rangdan Empire, had conquered a thousand worlds and vanquished some of the most terrible foes to stand against the Imperium. Dulan would seem to have represented one of many tests, a test that allowed the two to take a measure of each other, and the test oft repeated when they or their warriors met, but one repeated without the rancor often attributed to it. There exists no greater symbol of the loyalty held between the two legions, the Wolves of Fenris and the Knights of Caliban, then in the final days of the rebellion against the Emperor, when Horus himself trembled as the two legions reunited as brothers in arms, ready to test themselves against the forces that lay siege to Tara. The Subjugation of Saraj the Dark Angels' fourth expeditionary fleet under the command of Lionel Johnson took part in the continued compliance of Sarosh, officially codified as Sigma 517, but known to the Dark Angels as 43, the third world brought to compliance by the fourth expeditionary fleet which had formerly been commanded by an officer of the White Scars Legion. Lionel Johnson went in answer to a call for aid from his brother, Jagatai Khan. Of all the Primarchs, the Khan stood closest to the Lion, for despite their differences, each appreciated the honest and forthright nature of the other, and so the Lion was ill-disposed to ignore his call. The Sarosi, 
ruled by a planetary bureaucracy, had recently expressed their interest in becoming part of the Imperium, and the Imperials were eager to allow them in, believing that these people seemed to possess the same secular beliefs as they did in the Imperial truth. But over a standard year had passed and the Sarosi were as yet no closer to attaining compliance, constantly apologizing to the Imperial planetary governor chosen for their world, Harlad I, that their bureaucracy was slowing the process. But the Sarosi, without mentioning it to the Imperial expedition, secretly worshipped chaos entities in the warp they called the Melachim and saw the anti-religious stance of the pre-heresy Imperium's imperial truth as unsuppressed evil. After the Dark Angel's fleet arrived in orbit to accelerate the compliance process, the Lord High Exactor, the leader of the Sarosi bureaucracy, who had been invited aboard the Invincible Reason to meet the Primarch, denounced L. Johnson and the Emperor to the Primarch's face aboard their flagship, and L. Johnson responded by ramming his power sword through the fanatical Sarosi leader's body. But the Sarosi delegation had also brought a hidden nucleonic device aboard their shuttle, intending to assassinate the fleet's entire command structure, including L. Johnson, in one fell swoop. However, Luther and a junior librarian named Zahariel El Zurias managed to eject the shuttle into space, causing only minor damage to the flagship. Luther admitted to Zahariel that he had discovered the device earlier and had briefly considered allowing it to kill his oldest friend, largely because of the jealousy that had begun to grow in his soul. The rebels on Sarosh would be crushed for their treachery, brought to heel swiftly by the might of the Dark Angels and the Imperium's armies. But the victory would leave a bitter taste for many. In the aftermath of the fighting, some questioned the ease with which the Sarosi had infiltrated the First Legion's defenses and thought none would call what had occurred treachery. There were those whose devotion to the Legion's new path was questioned. Luther, Zahariel, and five hundred of the angels drawn from among the veterans of both Terra and Caliban were to find themselves returned to Caliban, not in exile, but neither in triumph. There, they were to serve as a garrison force, the overseers of the Lion's Sanctuary, and to continue the recruitment of new space marines into the Legion from the Calibanite population. They were required to leave the Great Crusade behind, regardless of their legacy of standard years in service in either the Calibanite forest or among the stars. This was the determination of the Lion, that he would set aside even those whom he held dearest in the name of duty. Some would name it arrogance, and others, with the benefit of hindsight, would call it foolhardy. It wasn't the cold logic of battle favored by some among the Primarchs, but the proud imperative of duty and excellence that those who faltered be set aside, no matter how justified or small the failing, and the worthy grow stronger through the trials they faced. The Final Days of the Crusade By this creed of strength and excellence, the First Legion, the Dark Angels, lived and died continuing the work of the Emperor in the last days of the Great Crusade. 
Wherever the tide of imperial conquest slowed, they were to be found. Bright swords and grim resolve against the worst horrors of the galaxy. Lionel Johnson, now long parted from the forests of Caliban, and a staunch believer in the dream of human empire embodied in his gene father, fought with every moment given to him. He spent no time on parades, fortress building, or in petty squabbles with his kin, but went stoically from battle to battle. He and his legion began to shun the gatherings of the Great Crusade and the fellowship of their brothers among the Legiones Astartes, scorning those who would fret over such frivolities while there remained enemies of power and strength to test their mettle against. As the years and wars wore on, a distance grew between the Dark Angels and the other legions of the Imperium. Few of the Primarchs cared to take the time to seek out their reclusive brother as he and his legion continued to wet their blades to a keen edge. They began to forget the deeds he and his warriors had performed, for he rarely spoke of them, all except one. Horus Lupercal, ever watchful, paid much heed to his brother and the actions of his legion. Once he had tried to bind them to him, only to find the cipher of their ways a shield against his influence and their pride a foil to his manipulation. His and Lorgar's warrior lodges would find no purchase within the ranks of the Dark Angels, as they were shunned by the preceptors of the Order's Militant and the proctors of the wings of the Hexagrammaton as worthless and beneath them. The Dark Angels were not, and never could be, Horus's to command. The Dark Angel's master was as his legion, a rock in which Horus could find no crack or chink in which to fix his barbs, no psychological leash by which he could lead him along paths of his own choosing. The lion was not well liked among the Brotherhood of the Primarchs, but he had the respect of each and every one of them, and more than that, he had the trust of his father, the Emperor, and the keys to the hidden and ancient arsenals of terror. Were the Emperor to choose a single one among his Primarchs to lead, to stand at the head of the Great Crusade, then Lion L. Johnson was a choice easily understood, and this troubled the master of the Lunar Wolves. So, when the conquest of Ulanor Prime loomed before him in M30, he was sure to see the Lion and the First Legion diverted to far battlefields and tendered him no invitation to the great triumph of Ulanor that followed. So it was that when Horus was crowned as the War Master of the Imperium, the Lion was not present. A victory to the covetous mind of the new War Master. Yet, this was one of the few miscalculations made by the shrewd intellect of the War Master. He counted all men of power to think as he did. Yet while the Lion and the Wolf of Luna shared many traits, they were not the same. When news of Horus's new rank reached Lionel Johnson, he did not pause in his campaigns, nor did he offer congratulations or lament his own fortune, and this, more than the reaction of any of his other brother Primarchs, gave the War Master pause. When Horus's thoughts later turned to rebellion and treachery, after his fall to chaos in the Temple of the Serpent Lodge on Davin, it is likely 
that it was the lion he marked as among the greatest of threats to his plans. The Dark Angels were both numerous and skilled in all the arts of war, with access to the armories of Terra and Psy Arcana forbidden to all others, and their Primarch was as inflexible as iron, loyal beyond doubt to the Emperor and resolute enough to rise up against any threat to his father's grand dream of human unity. As with all of the Primarchs, the Warmaster did not feel fear as did lesser mortals, but the thought of facing Lion L. Johnson in open battle at least gave him pause, and if he would not be turned to the traitor's cause, then he must be removed. There were three Space Marine Legions Horus sought to remove from the path of his heresy before it began. The white scars he hoped to preserve for his own use, the blood angels he hoped to destroy or corrupt, but the dark angels he hoped to banish, to send far enough away that by the time they could return, his grim business would be complete. This was not to be, for the lion would return to the Imperium as the sun returns to the horizon each morning, blinding and implacable, and he would reach for the heart of his fallen brother. Horus had loosed a beast, the equal of any that lurked in the world straddling forests of Caliban or the silent dark between the stars, one that would tear apart the Imperium if only to grasp a victory of ashes and blood.